and not very hungry. So imagine the amount of food waste that is happening in all hotels, in buffets. Um, I mean, this region in general, uh, UAE specifically, right, is all inclusive buffet-based. So imagine all of that. And that is just only one small element. So we're actually now putting together um, a whole sustainability um, department which will focus on making sense of sustainable hotel construction from the investment and ROI standpoint. But uh, you're more focused on the operations and how to make operations sustainable, eco-friendly, and how to use um, artificial intelligence and the latest uh, technology in doing that. So I think I'll hand over to the moderator. I think that's about, uh, I'm out of my depth in terms of what you're going to talk about. So I welcome on, uh, on the stage uh, Wojciech Orlowski. Uh, former country director Batil, and now, as far as I have heard, one of the better and more famous F&B consultants of the region. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated and uh, let's talk about sustainability and our corporate governance and uh, all the opportunities associated with that. Let me welcome to the stage Mr. Asim. He will introduce himself in a better way shortly. And uh, Mr. Mohamed. So, in order to start and perhaps uh, introduce everyone into the subject, we'll talk that uh, Saudi Arabia wasted around 30% 30, 30 of its food on an annual basis, and of course, very much so similar numbers are applicable in the region. Um, so anything that we could do in order to reduce that, anything that we could do in order to utilize the technology that is today available, it would be not only the mandatory responsibility of any business owner, but also an amazing opportunity to be better for the environment and be better for our margins. So Mr. Asim, uh, to start with, please introduce yourself and then we will move forward with the questions. Thank you, Wojek, and thank you, DMG Events, for the invitation. My name is Asim Hamid Khan, and I am the group director for one of the projects funded by PIF. We are still passing through that transformation, so I cannot reveal the name. However, my first half of the career was with Dubai Holding in Dubai. Uh, I landed here in Saudi in 2014. I worked with different family offices. My last assignment was uh, with Events Investment Fund, uh, and I'm proud to say that that was shared by His Royal Highness. For the last 25 years, I was into operations, facilities, and mainly into sustainability and ESG. Thank you so much. And uh, Mohammed, please go ahead. It's your turn. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having us on the panel in this exciting event. Uh, my name is Mohammed Shah. I work as the uh, Smart City Director for Knowledge Economic City. Our development is based in Medina. Uh, we've got about 6.8 million square meters of land that we're developing uh, in different sectors, hospitality, retail, commercial, knowledge, education, healthcare, and uh, entertainment and uh, retail spaces. Um, sustainability is something very close to my heart. It's part of our overall smart city strategy. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today and uh, learning from my panelists as well. Thank you. So let us start with the first question to Asim. Given that sustainability is not just a buzzword and within the increasing focus on ESG as a value creation level rather than just compliance, how can companies move beyond box checking and truly integrate innovative and technological solutions to drive substantial climate action and decarbonization, especially in the light of the recent learnings from COP28 UAE. So, Wojcik, uh, sustainability, I think, is no more a buzzword. Uh, the focus on the ESG within the region is at all-time all high. And uh, the best part is that this is look beyond the compliance lens and more sort of a value creation lever. Uh, too many companies, they have embraced the box checking uh, um, culture, which ultimately helped in um, uh, uh, or encouraging uh, in the uh, increasingly 
standardize ESG practices. But I believe this is not enough. Uh, companies must move beyond the box ticking culture and the window dressing. You asked about the COP28 learnings. I think what I would say, innovation and technology are the two drivers which are basically uh, driving the transformative era of climate action. And both are underpinning uh, the ambitions to bring the decarbonization and electrification goals within reach. Uh, but what is important is to collaborate and to accelerate uh, their deployment. Uh, the message here is that in the path to net zero, we have to adopt all technologies, the breakthroughs which we are having today and all the tried and tested ones. Look, combining AI with the, both food and energy management will only enhance the sustainability performance. So efficient energy use means that you are saving on your operational cost and at the same time, lesser impact on your environment. While when we talk about food and less food waste, which means that we are not only addressing the uh, security of the food, which we are facing a challenge with, but also uh, we are uh, uh, overcoming the ecological footprint which we are having because of the waste disposal. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think uh, only actions can can make the variance and can make the real difference in the businesses these days. And uh, embracing that, as you rightly say, it is the mandate of the all business holders these days. So, Mohamed, moving to you. How can AI solutions be effectively combined to tackle both food waste and energy management in the hospitality sectors, particularly in the regions like Saudi Arabia, where food waste is still high? What strategies can hotels implement to optimize both areas and how does a dual approach contribute to broader sustainability goals, including reduction of the carbon footprints and enhancing brand reputation? I believe you can speak about it with the massive project that you have within the economic city. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that question. It's a very interesting question. And uh, it, it, it reminds me of how we manage logistics and, and, and supply chain and flow. Yeah? So I think what we need to do is we need to utilize the power of AI in hospitality in better measuring what we're doing, okay? And better understanding demand. If we understand demand properly using AI tools and really dig deeper into the requirements of the customers, the average meal consumption, the most liked and disliked uh, menu options, there's so much AI can do for you in this eat-all-you-can buffet environment that we've got uh, in hospitality to drive production, just like in manufacturing. You know, our manufacturing over the decades dramatically improved and slimlined. I think hospitality has to do the same thing where we can minimize wastage. If we are able to understand demand more effectively, and demand across times, what is a breakfast demand, what is a lunch demand, what is room service demand, what is dinner demand, weekday, weekends, peak periods, slow periods. Once you get that demand, then you're able to configure operationally supply. If you can then configure supply to be closer to the demand curve, then the gap of waste will no longer be there. Waste actually is ineffective planning. Yeah. The chefs and the restaurants are doing one thing, and the front desk is bringing different types of people in. So there's no communication. AI and data analysis and analytics and measurement and things like IOTs, Internet of Things devices, yeah, can all work homogeneously together to give you this better demand pattern. If that demand pattern's better, operationally, you will produce to demand. You know, why, why, why doesn't... McDonald's throw away 40% of the food, that's their margin, because they have got this right. There were Japanese, you know, methodologies of supply, like Kanban. I remember studying this, I don't know, 25 years ago, where, you know, fast food is on Kanban systems. You know, if you've got three burger orders, there's a fourth one being cooked, there isn't an 11th one being cooked. So there, I think that flow is very important on one side. On the second side, I think from an AI point of view, 
if you do get to an overflow situation and a wasted situation, before expiry of the food, there's different ways you can use applications to distribute the food. Yeah? And there are apps now available in the West where people can sign up uh, for bakeries and other things, and it'll show them end-of-day products that are available. And there can still be a revenue generation. We don't have to put it in, uh, in the bin or uh, wastage. We can still get some revenue from that food because we've got the available resources in terms of redistributing that food outside the hospitality um, asset. So I think these are the things where we can really use AI to reduce the wastage, improve the sustainability, and the bottom line for the asset owner and the operator. Perfect, amazing. And just so everyone is aware, those apps which uh, Mohammed rightly is talking about are today available in Saudi, and they are also available for those who would like to procure, not even for your personal consumption, but to do zakat, which obviously is very much so embedded within the culture in the kingdom. So, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Asim, moving to you. With respect to the hospitality industry, how the hospitality industry capitalize on this trend? What strategies can be employed to prioritize sustainability throughout the asset life cycle? And how can embracing innovative financial models and technologies reduce risks, improve financials, and meet evolving demands, both guests as well as the investors? Good question, uh, Wojek. Most of the real estate development companies here think that it's an economical burden on them when they will implement sustainability. But uh, uh, multiple study research, uh, uh, it shows that, uh, for example, LEED certified hotels, they will have uh, the uh, revenue uh, per average room available uh, 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 will be higher. Uh, so there was a study carried out by Cornell University where they took data of almost 90 LEED certified hotels and they compared it with 500 non-certified LEED hotels. And uh, the result shows that the average rate of the guest per night, it increased by $20 for the LEED certified hotel. So the, the intricate relationship between sustainability and the value creation is increasingly evident. Uh, I think prioritizing the sustainability throughout the asset life cycle, from design to operation, from financial modeling to technology, it will reduce the risk and it will give you the access to the capital and improve your performance, which is financial performance. And at the same time, it will increase the demand of the guest and the investors alike. Thank you. Thank you, Asim. Um, Mohammed, uh, if we may ask you, how can we further explore and implement AI technologies and uh, to enhance food waste reduction in food service industry? Specifically, what are some of the successful case studies or innovative approaches for using AI in inventory management, portion control, menu, ad menu adjustments, and real-time monitoring? Um, I, th I think what we need to do, first of all, is break down the hospitality process, yeah? And look at the, you know, uh, f the farm to the waste basket cycle you know, in terms of procuring the food, the, uh, the raw materials, and right to the end of that cycle, after the, 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 you know, hospitality guests have had their dining experience. What we need to do is to sketch out that process, and once we've sketched out that process, we can use AI with data points throughout that process, and we break that process down, yeah, to smaller parts, and we can use data gathering instrumentation to understand the data dynamics in each of those subsections of the process. And then we can use AI to try and streamline and harmonize that process. Because I think what we're getting now is that they're disconnected. You know, the procurement people right, right from the, the sourcing, yeah? Maybe they're sourcing uh, raw materials close to end of shelf life you know, your, your, your lettuce, your fresh items, your bananas, all these things. So that gives a very, very compressed amount of time 
for the kitchen staff and the preparation staff to use that material because there isn't enough life of the raw materials. So you've got to really start from the farm angle and then break it down. AI will help you to normalize it, take away the bumps. That itself, I'm sure, can give you 20, 30 percent improvement before you hook into, as I was saying before, the demand pattern. So if you synchronize supply and demand and procurement, I think that's the best way to optimize the use of AI to minimize this issue for the uh, hospitality operators. Thank you, Mohammed. And allow me to ask a personal follow-up question here now. Um, given your role and given the mandate of the government and given everything that is happening in the kingdom with the vision, I believe everyone here is seeing the wonderful plans and fantastic development of the region and the kingdom itself. Is there anything that your entity does in particular to, let's say, incentivize the new companies to enter and follow certain guidelines with respect to the AI technology usage as well as the ESG? Well, from, from our point of view, when we have our smart city design and blueprint for digital technologies to be used in our developments, whether it's in hospitality, whether it's in education, whether it's in a commercial or retail environment, we try and follow international standards. Uh, using standards is the best unified language, you know, for people who consume that technology, people who implement that technology, and people whose data is there. Now, recently you've seen the kingdom, you know, implement the data restrictions that you see in Europe and the US. That started 14th of uh, September, that's a really good step forward in terms of protecting privacy of data. Yeah? And this helps companies that are international come into the Saudi market because they recognize these standards. We follow these international standards and it's really great to see the digital authorities in the kingdom adopting more and more of these international standards. So that becomes a common playing field and a baseline. There's nothing alien for an international vendor to come into Saudi Arabia and participate in the digital journey. So I think that's very critical. And then being open and transparent with them with the opportunities. Yeah, AI still is in, is in its early stages. You know, it's a, it's a canvas that has not been painted yet. So I think when we collaborate together, look at best practices internationally, look at vendors that feel comfortable with this uh, standardized base, look at developers like us who work there, and then we sketch out the customer journey, I think that's the best way for all parties to win. Amazing. Uh, I would say one thing on a personal level, coming from the hospitality background and F&B and retail industry here in the kingdom, I would love to see not only major players racing with the AI technology and with the development and spend on this particular segment, but I would love to see um, a platforms that would enable smaller businesses, you know, smaller street outlets here in the kingdom that would perhaps share their loyalty program, share their ability to utilize the data from the customer, from the customer behavior to reduce the waste and optimize the efficiency and ultimately support the vision and support everything that we are talking about today. Um, Perhaps lastly, Asim, coming to you, and probably also on behalf of the audience today, Asim, how do you see dual challenges of digital and green transition? How can we combine it both? Well, uh, today the human societies, uh, they are facing dual challenges, as you rightly said. One is uh, the digital and the other one is green transition. Uh, while technology is bringing growth, but it also introduces uh, the ethical issues, which is basically related to AI, and at the same time, acceleration of the uh, digitalization, uh, impact on carbon uh, or uh, uh, climate change, basically. So the generative AI rapid rise is basically outpacing uh, the uh, regulatory adoption. Um, I would say that uh, the education systems, they must embrace a uh, human-centered mindset. At the same time, uh, the uh, digital competencies, 
which are aligned with this transition. Uh, and that will help basically uh, uh, for the technology uh, to uh, align with the sustainable and ethical goals. Thank you, Asim. Mohammed, would you like to add anything to this? Well, I'm, I'm just trying to think back in what happened in life and, and, and how generative AI changes things. And the, and the analogy I have is the calculator changed the numerical world. Yeah? AI will change the text world. Yeah? So you'll go through this quantum leap in the ability to get output. You know, in the old days, we would have to learn equations and formulas and times table and stuff. And the calculator came and accelerated and killed all of that. Now, the same thing will happen with text and data, with AI. And, and it really is amazing, you know, with generative AI, the number of things you can use it for, for good, is infinite. And I think, as you said, it's, 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 it's a playing field for those young entrepreneurs, those startup businesses to develop, you know, it's a palette for them to paint, you know, the pictures of tomorrow. And I think that's the exciting thing about generative AI. And, and, and as they say, we ain't seen nothing yet. What will happen in the next three to five years with that? And machine to machine, the acceleration will be amazing. So we have no reason to find any excuses in respect to the <laughs> doing the things right. <laughs> Neither because of the human or the computers, I would say. Um, I believe this brings us to the end of the session and uh, we still have time for one or two questions from the audience. If anyone would like to ask anything to the panelists. Yeah. And we get the mic. Yeah, so my question is about, uh, I come from a design background. So we are exposed, uh, we are food service consulting firm, food service laundry. Uh, we are exposed to technologies like demand control ventilation for the kitchen hoods for peak load optimizations, technologies like. So are there any incentives being provided by the, the government or the, any entities to make this uh, popular over here? Yeah, uh, I think what needs to happen is that uh, if you have any specific suggestions where your technology can actually help in either increasing GDP, or reducing cost, or improving the customer experience, I think there's a lot of, you know, regulatory entities that are very happy to hear ideas. They've got a very, very open mind. The beauty of 2030 is that, you know, it's, it's getting ready for the future. So I think uh, the responsibilities for people that do have good ideas is to pitch them here locally. And I think you'll find, you know, uh, a very, very open mind in supporting, whether it's through VC funding and getting a startup license and initiating that particular solution in the kingdom or finding potential uh, pilot areas where you can, you know, try that solution. Uh, and I, th there's different elements of licensing, you know, that are more flexible for entrepreneurs and for uh, innovative talent to come in in the digital, digital space because uh, digital transformation is one of the key elements of 2030. So if any value adder can come in and do that, um, I think you'll find a lot of support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions? Like this chance? Please. In audience participation, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the mic. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi, I would like to ask that like AI is about to like take over many tasks and make it simplified for us. So I would like to ask that many people will be also losing their jobs, their employments in the fields. So what skills do you like suggest that people should sharpen in this upcoming AI controlled world? I can answer this on behalf of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which I truly love and I've spent here last six years. Within the F&B and hospitality industry, we are going to create 1.4 million jobs 
within the tourism sector prior to 2030. I don't think we have to be worried necessarily to that extent. I think it's our responsibility to contribute to the AI development, and once we do that, there will be plenty of opportunities for ourselves, for the human interaction. Human also needs to manage the AI. Human needs to also protect the environment. Human needs to develop the many areas within the kingdom and the regions around us with respect to the hospitality, with respect to number of sectors. One sector is optimized, one sub sector is, let's say, um, taken the advantage of AI, the human error is reduced, the services are improved. It's an ecosystem that we have to embrace, it's an ecosystem that we wish to enhance and we wish to accelerate, but you know, it has taken hundreds of years for people to know how to drive, it will take a while by the time we have to be worried. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, and it's a very good question that you mentioned, and it's a fear that a lot of people have about AI. Um, I think the best thing is to look at history. You know, if we look at the time our fathers were here, our grandfathers were here, our great-grandfathers were here, there's always what they call industrial res revolution, automation, machines. You know, the tractor came, and you didn't need 100 people with a fork on the, on the land, yeah? You look recently, you know, we used to have those uh, old phones, and you look at this, yeah? The most valuable companies in the world are related to this, much more than Ford and GM and, you know, Kellogg's or Mars, yeah? So there's new generations of businesses will come. AI will open the door for those new generations of businesses. And, you know, your children and your grandchildren will want to work in a very different environment to the way we work. They'll want more challenging opportunities and they'll want opportunities and work that is more flexible for them. Yeah? So this will work hand in hand. New industries will start. And as my colleague said, new job creation will happen. So humans will always have a, a need. And they'll just move higher into the you know, sort of uh, hierarchy of jobs. They'll do more intelligent-based jobs rather than manual jobs. And I think that's going to be more satisfying. And they'll have more time. You know, we always talk about this life-work balance. You know, if you've got things doing the repetitive things, you can do more value-adding things that will give you more satisfaction in life. This is the way we look at it. OK. I hope we answered your questions. So I'll thank you very much, everyone. And it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you.